Avoid radioactive mist and what rain. What do they mean by radioactive mist? From the river. Okay, so picture this. You're telling a story about a young sea monster searching for freedom and a chance to prove himself. He's going to do this by winning a big race. For the past 120 years, filmmakers have told similar stories, figuring out what works and what doesn't. And to top it all off, you have state-of-the-art animation software at your disposal. So where do you start? Well, how about a film from 1925? Even if you haven't seen Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, you might be familiar with its title as the most expensive film of the silent era. It's also known for its magnificent chariot race sequence, with a legacy that is extended to places like the streets of Los Angeles, a coastal town in Italy, and a galaxy far, far away. So what lessons can this film teach us about how to make a race scene engaging? The chariot race, which is seven and a half minutes long, has nine charioteers. One is Judah Ben-Hur, a Jewish prince who spent five years in slavery after his Roman childhood friend betrayed him. Another is Masala, the very man who sold him out to advance his own political career. There's one clear hero and one clear villain. And that's lesson number one. Regardless of how many people are in the race, there are only two people who really matter. That's why in something like The Fast and the Furious, you'll usually see two cars in the lead. In the film's first street racing scene, a four-car race concentrates on two of its racers, the infamous Dominic Toretto and newcomer Brian Spillner, by putting them ahead of the rest. The scene cuts back and forth from Dominic and Brian to emphasize their feud, putting their two cars, which are complementary colors, in a high-speed world of their own. When they reach the finish line, we realize that they weren't even that far in the lead. It's just movie magic that set them apart. Now, this chariot race is intense for a few reasons. The stakes are high, with Judah seeking vengeance against the man who wronged him years ago. There's money on the line, too. Overconfidence has led Masala to bet his entire fortune on the race. Lesson number two, it's always more than a race. To these characters, winning represents an opportunity to prove their worth to the world and to each other. This is how the pod race functions in The Phantom Menace. Anakin, a slave, earns his freedom by winning the race, allowing him to go off and train as a Jedi. The film shows us how important the race is by cutting to his friends and family watching him. Their worried faces help us understand the gravity of the situation. Back to Rome. Masala is so set on winning that he plays dirty and uses his whip against Judah. In the 1959 version of Ben-Hur, his chariot even has spikes on it. That's lesson number three. It's never easy. An engaging race scene needs obstacles and setbacks to get our blood pumping just like the characters. This is taken to the extreme in Speed Racer, which uses tricked out cars that can actually fight each other. In the final race scene, Speed's competitor also plays dirty, with an illegal modification meant to slow him down. Speed Racer takes the breakneck surrealism of the Fast and the Furious and amplifies it, making us feel every hit. Now, let's go to Porto Rosso, Italy, where undercover sea monster Luca is about to take off on his bicycle. He's competing in a triathlon called the Porto Rosso Cup. To win my famous race, your team must be the first to brave the treacherous waters of the bay, devour a mystery bowl of my delicious pasta, and ride to the top of Mount Portoroso and back! That all sounds pretty hard. Yeah. Luca had originally entered with his friends Alberto and Julia, under the team name Underdogs. You know, we underdogs have to look out for each other, right? What's under the dogs? The group fell apart after Alberto was exposed as a sea monster and Luca was forced to flee out of fear of the bloodthirsty townspeople. But Luca is determined to win, so he comes back as a team of one. He doesn't do too well in the first two events and begins the final part with Ercole, reigning champion and all-around unpleasant person, in the lead. He starts to pedal uphill. Almost immediately, he encounters his parents, who have been up on the surface looking for him. They want to send him to the deep sea as punishment for leaving the safety of the water. But Luca wants the freedom to go wherever he wants, 
freedom that he thinks can be found in a Vespa that he'd buy with the prize money. In an engaging race scene, it's always more than a race, and winning the race will give Luca independence that he's never had before. He weaves through the other racers and passes Ercole. These are the two people who really matter. When he gets to the top, rain forces him to stop and hide. If he gets wet, the townspeople will find out he's a sea monster and target him. Even though the first half of the race looked promising for Luca, it's never easy. And with this setback, it looks like he'll never win. It gets worse when Alberto comes to help him, outing his sea monster identity in the process. Here, Luca has a choice to make. Should he take a risk by going out in the rain? Or should he stay safe and let Alberto be captured? He chooses to take the risk, and soon he's barreling down the hill with his best friend. Now the race is really picking up. At this point, it's more than a race because the sea monster's lives are at stake. The editing quickens and the camera angles become more pronounced. It's fragmented and frenetic, and you can't take your eyes off it. And what about animation? When a race is animated, the medium allows for extreme exaggeration that pushes every action beyond the constraints of reality. In fact, if you don't exaggerate, your race scene becomes stiff and unappealing, which is why this animated version of Ben-Hur doesn't work. When it looks like all hope is lost, their old friend Julia comes to the rescue and knocks Ercole off his bike. Maybe it's okay to play dirty sometimes. It wasn't easy, but the three underdogs end up winning the race. Ercole's reign of terror is over, and the townspeople realize that the sea monsters aren't scary beasts to be hunted and killed. It was more than a race because winning has brought about more understanding and acceptance of outsiders. And remember how I said Luca and Ercole were the two people who really mattered in the race? Well, by the end of the scene, we realize that it's actually about a different pair of characters, or maybe even three of them. Luca's race scene is so good because it has the typical characteristics of a captivating cinematic race, but it's not a direct copy. It diverges in its use of animation and its overall focus on friends coming together rather than enemies competing for a prize. These two enhancements highlight the emotional core of the scene and the film as a whole. So you could say that Luca's best scene is also its least original. It builds upon tried and true elements of racing scenes established across a century of filmmaking, recognizing what audiences expect and then challenging that by delivering a twist on the classic formula. Feast your eyes on the greatest best that the world has ever seen! Now we've reached the finish line. Did I leave out your favorite race scene? Leave a comment and let me know. If you'd like to help me produce more videos, consider supporting my channel on Patreon. My name is Kaylin also known as Kiki Crazed, and thank you for watching.